All right, got the record button here. Hopefully that's working all right for you. Um, does anyone actually watch them? I guess you guys show up in person, so you probably don't need to go and watch them after the fact, but I should ask people if they do watch them. Um, I think the quality is usually pretty decent. Um, I haven't had anybody complain yet, so if it's not working, let me know. Uh, but happy to keep trying that for fun. So we're on to the second half of the loops chapter, or like second little bit of it here. Um, when we start talking about loops, there's a lot of other cool things we can do with loops, and then some more of the advanced features of loops. I spent one minute talking about Project 1 here. Apologies uh, for that, but it was posted. It's a little lunar lander simulator. Um, the idea of it being a lunar lander is just so that there's something we're doing, right? It's not actually a lunar lander or anything interesting. Uh, that's just like the story behind what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, and there's tons of different ways we can go about it here. I, I generally don't give you a lot of, hey, this is what it should look like because everyone does it different. And, and I like seeing that people approach it different ways because if I give you an example that says, hey, this is what it looks like when I run it, 95% of the time that I get that exact same thing back and that's really dull versus if you come up with how you want to interact with your program, it's a little bit different, right? Some people like using numbers for their menu. Some people like using letters. Some people like using whole words. Some people, whatever you want to do right, for your menu, that's up to you. And, and that's the sort of thing you'll get better at the more you work with it. Like, how do I want to interact with the computer? What do I want to have to type in here? So if you think about what makes sense for you, it'll probably work out pretty well for you here. So uh, we're going to do some more practice with loops here. Uh, a couple other fun things we can do with loops. And then we'll look at some of those advanced things here. So I'm going to start at the top of our file here because otherwise everything runs at the beginning here. So one fun thing we can do with loops is get some valid input. So if you're giving the user a choice, do you want A, B, C, or D? Right? We can use a loop to make sure that they only give us A, B, C, or D. Right? And that way we don't get something that's not valid. Right? So the, the first example where our project was, hey, do you want to serve drinks? Do you want to serve ice cream? Or do you want to serve pizza? If they type in anything else, it's gibberish. We just said, okay, please run again, which is not the most friendly thing in the world. So what we can do is we can make this list of like valid options here and make it a list or a tuple. Probably a tuple's more correct because we're never going to change this thing. It doesn't really matter, uh, but it's, you know, sure, we'll think about it here. So if I can say, hey, my valid options for this, um, and let, let's do, we'll do our pizza, we'll do drinks, and then we'll do ice cream. Ice cream. Now, what I want to do is I want to get some input from the user here. So I'm, eventually I'm going to have an input here. I'm just going to start, uh, I don't know, maybe we'll call it the user's choice. How about that? I'm going to start off as blank here. It needs to have a value so I can use it in the loop. So I can say while the user's choice is not in the list of valid options. Right? We can use this little membership operator. If it is in the list, then it is valid. So I want if it's not in the list, I want this loop to run. Right? So this loop will then run and check to see if their, their choice was valid or not here. Um, now, I, actually, we could probably just ask them here then. Do you want, do you want to serve? Serve pizza, drinks, or ice cream. And then I want to take all of that to lowercase just to make my life easy here, right? Right as, as I get the input, take it to lowercase. Then if it's not in the list here, I can print you know, like invalid choice. Please enter pizza, drinks, or ice cream. And I guess we can just repeat this here then, right? We don't even need to print. We'll just say, hey, let's go change the user's choice and tell them it was invalid enter one of these. It was invalid, enter one of these. And as long as what they give me is not in this list of valid options, the loop is going to run again. It's not a very long loop, but it will run over and over and over and over and over as long as the, what they entered is not in the list of valid options. So as soon as they give me something that is in the list of valid options, this is no longer true. And when it's false, right, if it's not true, then the loop stops running. It doesn't run again. So then we'll be able to get to the next part of our code here. Right? So I like to call this a validation loop. Validation. Validation loop. Why? Okay. How do I spell that? Okay. Too many D's. Yeah. One D, not two D's. Right. And then eventually, okay, you picked whatever. Right? You picked um, user's choice. Sure. Just so we get to something here. So if we run it then. I can say whatever I want here, and it keeps on asking me to give it something valid here. Eventually then I can give it drinks, 
right? And I'll get my drinks option back out. So loops are super handy for getting valid input. If you know there's a finite range of, of options here, I can make sure I get that valid range, right? Now, if I'm asking the user to enter a number here, like, um, so we'll say, I don't know, some number is an int of an input, enter a value, I don't know, one to 100. Right? Maybe, maybe we're entering a score. How about that, enter, enter a score, one to 100. If it's not valid here, I want to ask them again. Now, with a range of like one to 100, I probably don't wanna make a list of one, two, three, four, five, like that's a lot of typing, right? I wanna do that. I could use the range option and check if it's in the range. That's not always gonna work super well for us, so it's probably easier to just do some quick comparisons, right? I can say while some number is less than one, right, actually I want one is, um, less than some number, less than 100. So 100 is okay, and one is okay, right? So this is the valid option here, right? So I want, well, not that. This gets a little awkward here, right? There's a couple options for doing it. So this reads a little bit weird, and you can put in some parentheses if you want to say, okay, this and then not that. The, I want the opposite. I want when it's not this, I want the loop to keep on going here. And we'll say that's you know invalid number. Keep on prompting over and over and over again. That's one way to do it here. So let's do pizza, and then so like 200, invalid number. 500, zero, negative one, whatever. It tells me it's invalid here. If I give it something that is valid, then the loop stops. Now that might be a little bit hard to read, so another option you could do for that, you could say while um, some number is less than one or some number is greater than 100, right? This is perfectly fine as well, right? You're saying if this is true or this is true, prompt them again, right? It's just another way of writing it here. So whatever works for you is okay, right? The, the logic is doing the same thing. Now the problem is you could typo some of this stuff, but that could happen anyway. And that's why we wanna test our code to make sure that what I meant to write is what it's actually doing, right? Um, I, I am quite fond of demoing code that I mean to do one thing, not doing that. Um, and that's just because that's what happens when you work, right? So you wanna try it out, right? Because just because it's in your head doesn't mean it comes out on, in code the right way especially when you're trying to work with some of these like ands and ors and getting stuff right here. So um, I'm gonna comment this one out for a second here because if we validate it, then this one will never run. I wanna make sure this one runs here. So we'll try one more time. So we'll do pizza and then like 200 and negative one and 2000 and then 50 should be good and it's okay. Because this is false, it's not less than one and it's not more than 100, that one's false. So false or false, the whole thing is false and the loop doesn't run. So we got a valid entry. So these are ways we can validate choices to make sure we get something that we expect to get back out, right? So when we're asking our user, hey, what do you wanna do here, right? We can use a validation loop to, to use those prompts, right? I think we looked at that number guessing game. Do we do that one in here? Pick a random number somewhere. Uh, yeah, our, our number guessing game. So if this is something you wanna do more than once and not have to run again, right? We can throw all of this in another loop. So these are like, hey, do you want to play again? Is that or do you want to run again? Or do you want to do this again? But you can ask them. So I like play again. I'm going to start off as a Y, and I can say while play again is equal to a Y, and probably lowercase it at some point, or maybe not. And then all of this then just gets tabbed in one, right? So you can grab multiple lines and hit tab. So if all of this belongs in the play again loop, it will keep on running over and over and over. But now we need to make sure we change play again, right? So play again that will equal the input of do you want do you want to play again? And then again, again, I'm going to suggest a Y or an N. If it's not a Y, the thing will stop. So if they tell me anything other than Y, the, the loop stops. I'm not actually validating. I'm not checking that they entered a Y or an N. If it's not a Y, it stops. It's just probably pretty safe. And again, I might want to lowercase it here. People love to yell at computers and yell on the internet and type in all caps all the time really rude, uh, so, so don't be like that, but we're just gonna lowercase it anyway, right? It's the, the uh, tone adjustment AI here we have going on. We just lowercase everything, and everyone sounds happier, right? So it's a quick way to take, do a play again. And if you remember back from Monday in the one minute 
um, because, of course, you all remember that very well because this is the only thing you have to focus on in your entire life. So you, you remember this class perfectly, I'm sure. Right? One of the things we have to do for the assignment is ask them if they want to play again. Right? The whole thing goes in a play again loop. So essentially you copy paste that and you get two points. Right? The whole thing is in a play again loop, two free points. Right? You know, this one's not hard. Right? Um, so I try and put these rubrics in so you know what you're getting scored on. Right? And then um, ideally you do the self-assessment. Right? You can't actually use the rubric, which is obnoxious, like it's not interactive, but you can see it if you just like grab a screenshot of it and like mark do, 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 or say two points for this, two points for that. That works out pretty well. Um, again, the goal is everyone gets 100%, but I know stuff happens and if you don't, that's okay. Just aim for partial points um, and we'll get as many points as we can here. Um, but, you know, that's fun. So that's the 12 points for this project here with the rubric. Right, so you randomly set X and Y between negative 10 and 10. There's some quick arithmetic you can do for this, right? Um, but randint works really well for us. We don't have to do anything fancy. Other languages aren't quite as friendly sometimes, right? So to get a number between negative 10 and positive 10, pretty quick, right? Check for a valid command. Now, this is not a validation loop here because what we're going to do with this one here is if it's not a valid command, just tell them, hey, here's the things you can do, right? So it, it's not forcing them into this. Right? It, it could just be an option. Or, did they enter this? Else if. 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 This could just be an else right? in that loop that runs because right? they keep on running as long as the distance from the surface is more than zero. When the distance to the surface hits zero, it stops and we have to see did they land it levelly here? Right? Is your x tilt and your y tilt zero? Because if you're not level and your, your, your X or Y is off, you probably broke one of the, the landing feet and your lunar lander crashed and you killed the people on board. Um, I mean, the, the autonomous robot. We wouldn't send people out on a, on a robot that we control because um, that would just be silly. Clearly, like four tests is enough before you send a live person, according to Elon Musk, before we go to Mars. I don't know who's signing up for that after just four tests. Not me, right? I, I'm not, not feeling that. Um, but maybe someone wants to be the first person to die on Mars. Um, you'll probably end, end up in the history book at that point, right? So that's a little morbid, I apologize. I'm in a, a bit of a mood today. Um, we'll, we'll come back to this. All right. So using loops, right? So we do validation loops. We can do these little play again loops. There's some fun ways to do that here. Um, yeah, let's scroll all the way. I can run just this bit here, right? Let's do that. So I'm going to start with all of this here, and then I'm going to execute just the selection here. Right. So it runs once, right? Because I made it run once, right? I told it play again was Y, so I know the loop will run at least the first time, right? If you want to ask them at the top, say, hey, do you want to play? Then maybe it runs no times, but why are they hitting run if they don't want to play the game, right? So that's just a style preference, I guess. So I prefer to just run, and then I can ask do you want to play again. So how high the number? Let's guess between 1 and 10. Oh, man. I didn't import random here, sorry. If you just do that selection, it doesn't get your imports at the top. And now it crashed on me here. So I have to go import random again. I don't want my program to crash. Crashing is sad. Okay, 10. There we go. Guess the number one to 10. Five. Too high. Three. Too low. It's got to be four. Hey, we guessed it. Do we want to play again? Yes or no? So why? No. Why? Why? Don't type ahead. Just why? There we go. How high of a number do we want to guess? And now let's do a different number this time, 15. Right, so because we're resetting these things in the loop, works out really well for us, right? We can say, hey, I want to pick some different numbers. 7, 5, 3, 2, 1. Oh, it's all the way down to 1. Wow. Unlucky here. Six guesses. And we want to play again. Anything other than Y ought to work, and the whole thing stops, right? So just a little example how we can use a loop for that. Those, that's a lot of fun here. Um, so we did validation loops, we did different options for loops, we did our play again loop. Um, what's the other thing we did in lab? Oh, um, well we're looking at if they want to enter some value, right? The same sort of idea, do you want to play again, yes or no? That was kind of what we did with the lab of do you want to enter more values when we're getting our standard deviation. Yes. Okay. Keep on entering. Do you want to enter more values? Yes. Do you want to enter more values? Yes. Um, another way of doing that is using what I'll call a sentinel value. This is a sentinel value to stop a loop. So if I'm saying, hey, let's enter some scores and I want to get a list of grades here. So this will be my grades here. Is a list. 
and I want to do some, I'll get like the average grade, I'll get the highest grade, I'll get the lowest grade, um, get those sort of stats here. So I'm going to ask them to enter a grade. So we'll get a grade is an int of an input. Enter a grade 1 to 100 here. And then what I want to do is instead of asking them, hey, do you have more grades to enter, yes or no, because it gets to be a little bit tedious, I want to ask them to enter something that is specifically not a typical number that I would expect, not the usual input here. So I can say while grade does not equal negative 1, so, or negative 1 to stop. Here, let's do that to stop. So if they didn't enter something that's negative 1, this loop will run. So I can take my grades and I can append the grade. And then I'm going to ask them to enter more grades here. So I guess I don't need that first one here. Um, so I'll, pr I'll add this in the second prompt here. So if they enter negative 1, when I get back to the top of the loop here and it checks the condition, it says, oh, you gave me something that I, this is the sentinel value, it's a value that I don't expect here to indicate, please stop the loop. I mean, it just makes it a little bit easier for them to enter. So like you can just keep on typing numbers. I can type all 20 of your grades in without having to say grade, yes, grade, yes, grade, yes, grade, yes, grade. Yeah, it's a little bit obnoxious here. So I can just do grade, 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 grade. When I'm done, I'll hit negative one. No one gets a negative one score. That's impossible. So it's a specific value that is not what we expect, right? So I, I can use this to indicate, hey, stop running the loop here. And when I'm done, I want to print the highest one, I want to print the lowest one, I want to print the average. Um, so let's let's do a little loop. So we can say for grade, in grades. Now, if I give you a list of numbers, can you tell me which is the highest number? All right, I, you, can, you guys can, right? This is pretty easy. So I'll just spit out some numbers here, and then we'll figure out which one's the highest. So like 22, 37, 5, 19, 22, 35. Right, which one was the highest? All right, and what did you do in your head to know which one was the highest? What were you doing? Store that number and compare it to the other number. You're comparing it, yeah. So if you start with the first number, right, so we can say the highest grade is grades at zero. The first number is going to be my highest grade until I know otherwise, right? Because we already, we'll pretend we already have a list, right? I'm not spinning it out one at a time, but if I give you that list, you can look through them here. So I'm going to start with the first one, and I can say, hey, if the grade is greater than the highest grade, my highest grade is the grade. If it's not, I don't do anything. Just go to the next one, right? That's all I have to do. So now I have the highest grade, right? After I've gone through every grade in that list of grades, I have the highest. I can do the same thing with lowest, right? The lowest grade, grades at zero. Again, start with the first one. And I say, hey, if the grade is less than the lowest grade, the lowest grade is now the grade. Right? I can do both in the same loop. Now, I don't need this not an if or an else if. It probably could be because if it's higher than the highest grade, it's probably not lower than the lowest grade. Probably be okay. Uh, but again, it doesn't, doesn't really matter for our purposes here. So this will get my highest, my lowest, and then I can print. Um, so this is my I don't know, grade stats. Grade stats. So we have the, we want to do lowest is the lowest grade, and then average is the sum of grades divided by the length of grades. Right? I don't know how many are in there, but I can sum them all up and I can divide by the length pretty quick here. And then I can have the highest is the highest grade. Awesome. So let's give this a run. All right, so somebody shoot, shout out some scores for me here. 99? All right, you're aiming high. 12. 12. Ooh, uh-oh, they're in trouble. They haven't done their Zybooks. 80. 80? Sure. A couple more? 70. 70? Okay, solid C. C's good degrees. It's true. Any others? All right, negative one to stop. Sure, so we'll enter negative one to stop. Lowest was 12, looks correct. Highest was 99, looks correct. Average 65.25, probably correct. I don't know, let's go double check it here, right? It's, it's worth making sure that our code does what it's supposed to do here. Divided by four, 65.25. Seems to check out okay. All right, what about standard deviation? Like we did in our lab, should we calculate that as well? Now, 
I don't know if you, you noticed here, there's, um, I think I showed people, there's a statistics library you can use. Don't do this for your lab, because the point of the lab is to practice your scores here. Uh, but we can also then print the standard deviation was, this is statistics. Dot, and now we have population standard deviation, not the sample standard deviation, because it does change the formula here if we have all of them of grades. So this could double check your work. When you calculate the standard deviation, it should match this, right? All right, so let's do it again. What we had 99, we had 12, we had 70 and 80. I think standard deviation 32 points. Whew. It's kind of tough with only four numbers to get a, a good value here, right? I'm going to assume this one's right because I used the library function. Right? I didn't do it myself, right? We could, but that seems like a lot of work right now. Is that okay? Can we leave that one to the lab exercise? Okay. All right, so we can get some stats, which is fun. So these little sentinel values are helpful for loops. Right. Give me something over and over and over until you want to be done here. Now, same idea here. I could do another one here, like how about um, names? And I'm going to make this as a dictionary for fun here, because maybe I'll have your your names and your score, right? So we can have a name is something here, an input of a name, and then a score is an int of an input of enter score for name, oops, needs a F here, right? And then while name does not equal, how about like quit? Sure, right? Well, we can go do this. So I'm gonna take my name's dictionary, key of name, associate the value of score here, right? And I'm gonna prompt you again. Enter the name or quit to stop. And enter the store. Now, this is a little bit awkward because you probably don't want to ask for a score if their name was quit, right? So maybe we change it up a little bit here. So maybe we say um, how we prompt for score inside the loop first, and then I can add it, and then I'll ask for a new name. If it's not quit, then it will ask for the score, add the score and name, ask for a new name. Right? So just changing the order can make it so you don't have to repeat your code or have another if in there. Just a style preference. Um, you can add as many ifs as you want, but um, ideally the code's clean, easy to follow. Right? So this sort of sentinel loop is still a sentinel value because hopefully your mother and father didn't name you quit. It's got to be child abuse at that point, right? Like name it a kid failure or something. Just come on, um, don't name your kid quit. But it should work just the same here. So Eric, uh, I of course have a hundred, uh, and Jeb he probably has a ninety in here, and then we'll just say quit. Right. Oh, I should have printed it out here. Oops, we should print the dictionary. So we'll print names. One more time here. All right, so Eric has 100, Jeb has 90, and then we'll quit. Oh, I didn't do it all uppercase. It didn't match. I forgot to uppercase my input here. Now, I probably don't want to uppercase it because it's going to go into the dictionary with this. So I want to check here then with upper, not, getting, not uppercasing the input on name, right? Because you don't want to change what goes into the dictionary. Or maybe you do. I, it's, it's, I guess that's a preference up to you here. All right, uh, score for quit was 100, and then we'll try all uppercase quit. And I get Eric 100, Jeb 90, quit 100. We get our dictionary here, right? Key and the associated value. So you can use sentinel values with strings, you can use sentinel values with numbers, anything that we're asking the user to enter, if there's something that will be a clear indication that they want to stop, an unusual value here. Now, if we're just asking them to enter whatever here, we don't really know what they're going to type in, it's not going to work very well, right? Hey, like, start giving me all the words in a book you're writing. I don't know why you'd want to type it in one at a time, but sure, I can give you, here's all the words in a book. I don't know what's a bad value if you're writing a novel here, right? That's probably not a good use of a sentinel value at that point, because right? we don't know what something unusual is. But if we know, hey, here's a value you wouldn't usually enter, we can use it as a sentinel value to stop a loop. That's kind of a friendly way of going about, okay, enter things, enter things, enter things, enter things, right? Um, I think the other option I said um, is to ask them, hey, how many values do you want to enter? And then we can loop for 10 times. We could totally do that, but, you know, if, if they don't know how many ahead of time, they get to be really obnoxious to make them count it and then go enter all their values. Um, so usually these are just a little bit more friendly uh, when we're working with our users here. All right. So, yeah, 7% of loops. 
it's okay, right? By next week, this will be like 100%, right? You'll, you'll all be caught up on everything, right? It's for your own good, I promise, right? And you get points for reading the textbook. Like, do you ever get points for reading the textbook? It's kind of cool, right? I, just, I don't know. I kind of like Zybooks because it tracks that for me, and I can see if people are reading it. I don't go look and then, like, remind people because I feel like you're all adults, and this is enough pestering here. Um, but I could. All right, so let's go back to loops here. So a couple things we didn't get to yet. The break and continue. These are special keywords, and actually, I really don't like these. They, they kind of irritate me um, just because it makes our code look, I don't know, it behaves different. Um, I, I like when things behave the way I expect here. So while we're doing a loop here, we have some options. So if we want our loop to stop in the middle of whatever it's doing, we can use the break keyword. You know, I don't even want to come up with another example. We're just going to go with these here. Sorry. So why empanadas and taco costs? No, this one is this one's obnoxious. Um, but sure. So they're they're figuring out how much. If they can spend money that exactly matches here, We've got two different loops here. We're gonna break out of the loop. That's a terrible example. I'm sorry. You can go read that one. So we'll go through and um, why do we want to break a loop? Um, okay. So let's get some numbers here. So we'll have uh, our lotto, lotto ticket. This is our winning ticket. Winning ticket here is. Um, what do you want? One, three, no, one, two, three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen. Is that too many numbers? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, that's too many numbers. Just six. What are the first six prime numbers? Oh, one's not prime though, right? One doesn't count. You math majors, one isn't prime? Right? Pretty sure it doesn't count here. So we'll do the first five, six primes here. So this is our winning ticket. So we'll go ask the user to enter some values. So we'll say enter, or, or I don't know, for, about, here we go, so user's ticket, user's ticket. So a couple different ways we could do it is a list, and how about while the length of the user's ticket does not equal six? We'll ask them for a number. Right. Lots of different ways we could go about it here. But this one probably is pretty quick. I don't have need to start another value. I don't need to do a for loop. We need to say, okay, as long as the length isn't six, let's keep adding numbers here. So we'll get a number. So we'll take my user's ticket, and I can append the int of an input here, or a number for your lotto ticket. Now, you could do it on two lines here, right? You could say number equals the int of an input, and then append it, or you could throw it on one line. You can get parentheses inside of parentheses inside of parentheses inside of parentheses, and Python says, sure, order of operations. We do what's in the parentheses first. As, oh, there's another set of parentheses. Do what's in the parentheses first. Right? So you can do it all in one line. Some people really like to do it like that, sure. So we'll get six numbers. So eventually we'll have six numbers and we'll have a winning ticket here. So then what I want to do is I want to compare and see are my numbers in their numbers. Right? So, so for number in the user's ticket, now if my number is not in the winning ticket, because we're going to check by combination, not permutation. Right? So the order doesn't matter here because I don't need to check first number, first number, second number, second number. I'm just going to say if one of my number is in your number, is in your ticket here. Right? We can do that. So the number is not in the winning ticket, then we're going to break the loop here. So break says, all right, stop the loop immediately. Game over. You're done. You don't need to check anything further because you found one that didn't match. I don't care if the rest match here. If you don't have an exact match, you lose right? for our purposes, for, for this lotto game here. Right? So it's done loop will be over. If we get through the loop and we didn't break, then you're a winner here. We need to tell them, hey, you win. So this is where you can combine the, the else. Your loops can have an else here because it's kind of like an if statement. So when it becomes false, we'll get to their else here. We'll print you win, but this doesn't run if you break. So if you use the break keyword, it doesn't run this loop else. Yeah, lots of ways we could go about doing this. This is sort of using some, some Python shortcuts. I'm not the biggest fan of this. Um, there's other ways of doing it, but this ought to work for us here. So let's give it a try. So enter a number. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. Nothing happened. We didn't win, right? Because we had numbers that didn't match. So let's try it again. Let's give it numbers that match. So 13, 11, 7, 5, 3, and 2. And we get a, you win, right? We went through, we didn't break, so the loop else runs. 
Again, it's a little bit awkward here, so maybe I might say, hey, um, you know, um, did win, I don't know, win one is false. You can use a false or true keyboard. You can set values to true or false specifically here. And I can say, okay, so for number in um, oh, is that going to work for us? No. Uh, we'll say win is true to start. And then for number in the user's ticket, if the number is not in, then we'll set true uh, one equals false. So we're going to start off assuming you won, and then we're going to look at all your numbers, and if you have one that doesn't match, we'll say you didn't win. And at the end here, now then I can check, say, hey, if one, and I don't need to check anything here because this already is true or false. A lot of people will say, hey, if this is true, which is okay, but it's redundant here. And it's going to tell us, hey, you can simplify this expression. You don't need to say, does true equal true? Right? You can just say, okay, it already is true or not. And print, you win. Now we can say, else, print, you lose. You lose. Now we can do it up here the same way, right? Before you hit break, you can print you lose. Here, gets the same job done. I just, I'm not a big fan of breaks here because they, they're a little awkward and breaks up the usual. So typically our code will run like line by line by line by line and then loops will start back at the top run. Break just says jump to the end of the loop. You can have them in the middle of your loop here like they did. Middle of the loop and it stops the loop. Um, where's another? Uh, you can have continue, yeah, continues are similar. So it just, it's really messy here um, for doing it. This exercise is actually really good here. So for Simon Says, you break your loop real quick. If you if you messed up your Simon Says pattern, uh, that's a pretty fun use of it here. And it counts your score. So you can use the break with an else, or you can use a value here, a Boolean value, and change it here, and then look after. Uh, again, I'm kind of more partial to the second bit here. Um, but now we should be able to get, so if we have 13, 11, 7, 5, 2, and 3. Right, we won. We got all, we got the prime numbers here. Right, in both cases, we found out that we won here, and then let's try it again. Both cases should tell us we lost here. If we're one, two, three, five, and six, we lose both times. That's what we'd expect. Oh, exclamation mark! We should be excited if we win the lotto here. Right. So we can use break. It will just stop the loop from running. It's game over. Loop stops, and then any else clauses don't run. And you can also do else's with whiles as well. Um, I'm trying to think of a while with a break here. Could do one. So we could say, um, so similar to how we did these loops where we stopped here and we said while it's not quit, some people do a similar thing here and they'll say um, while true, which is an infinite loop. And then if name is equal to quit, break. And I think this is just lazy. Like put your condition in the while loop. But some people love doing these. Um, some chat does these occasionally as well. It's, it's the weirdest thing when the chatbots suggest these like while true loops, and they just use a break keyword. Sure, um, that's an option. But not not really fond of while true and then break here. Um, and then continue is a skip. So we could say, let's go back to the top here. We'll do, how about for number in range, let's do 100 here. And then we want to, um, if the number modulus three is zero, we're gonna continue. So continue is the keyword. What it does, it says stop the loop running now and go back up to the loop condition and see if there's more loop to run. So it'll go to the next value in a for loop or it'll go back to the while condition and test the while again here. We can print the number. So what this ought to do for us here is print every number that's not divisible by three. So because if it's divisible by three, we skip it. Essentially, it's like a skip. Skip to loop header condition. Condition. All right, so let's give that a run. We should get our numbers then that are not divisible by three. Right? One, two, four, five, seven, eight. Right? Numbers not divisible by three. Again, you can. It's just a little awkward, right? You know, instead of a continue, just like have an else here. So otherwise we could just do an else if we wanted to for our other version of this, right? 
Um, this will be instead of a continue, or we, we could say if not divisible by three print, right? Does the exact same thing for us. So just gives you another tool in your toolkit you can use if you like this style. Right? So we got lots of different ways we can control loops and make loop run specific ways um, that we want them to. All right, let's break and continue. Uh, oh, enumerate is really cool. So if we're going through a list here, right? So we did this, this idea when we went through lists of values here. So we had, um, I don't know, how about foods? Let's make a list of foods here. I'm hungry again, it's lunchtime. What, what are we having for lunch? Chicken noodle soup. Awesome. Homemade or from a can? Homemade. Homemade. That, that's the best. My wife makes a really good chicken noodle soup. You get the Costco chicken because it's like actually really cheap for their rotisserie chicken from Costco. And like you get decent meat out of it and you boil it on the bones and it's like a whole afternoon and the kitchen smells really good. I'm really hungry now. <laughs> really hungry. <laughs> All right. Chicken noodle soup. What else? That's the only thing we're having for lunch? Steak salt. What is it? Steak salt. Steak. Salt. A steak sub. Okay, there we go. Like from Subway or like homemade? Um, Subway, sure. Subway. What else? No one else hungry? Really? Salad. I should eat salad because I'm supposed to be on a diet. When you get old, your metabolism slows down and it's really sad. Salad is delicious. I love salad. It's the best thing ever. Definitely better than steak subs and chicken noodle soup. I really want with all the carbs. <laughs> I'm sure, this is enough. Fine. So we could say, you know, for food in foods, right? We could loop through and get each food out here. But now I don't have like the index values. Right? I want to say, hey, you know, one for this, two for this, three for this. Might be an easy thing to, to enter here. So maybe we want to do this as a menu. We could say for index in range length of foods. And we'll print enter I don't know, one for foods at index, right? Or no, I'm sorry, this is uh, index for foods at index. So this will give me a nice little menu here, right? Uh, I gotta scroll up to the top now, right? You can enter zero for chicken noodle soup, one for steak sub, two for salad. So if I have a list of options, I can really quickly print out a menu and say, okay, enter one, two, three, or four for these values. Prints out a nice looking menu. Right. But this is a little bit obnoxious to type sometimes. And the fine folks at Python said, hey, we, we know a way we can be faster. So instead of it doing it like this, we can say, oh, this syntax is crazy here. I'm trying to remember. So it's index and value in enumerate foods. That sounds right. We can say index and value. I think that works for us here. Let's try that. Hey, it didn't crash. Must have worked. So. If you're getting out both the index and the value, you can use enumerate as a little shortcut here. And then you comma separate, you get two different values here. There's actually some cool stuff happening behind the scenes in Python. It's unpacking these things that come in. It's actually making like a tuple. So I'm getting a, two values each time. And it's assigning both of them here and assigning both of them here. So I get index and value rather than index and the foods at an index. Right? So I saved a little bit of typing here with enumerate. It's kind of fun. So it's a nice little shortcut here. Um, but I think the same issue happens. You can't really change value, right? So we can say value equals value dot uppercase. Is this beeping? Is that what that is? I think it's this thing, stupid thing. Is that beeping red? It's every five seconds. Yep, I lost the connection. See, these stickers just don't last very well. Uh, my, I'm, my cyborg is falling apart. And I can't make that stop actually. Um, so it'll be beeping every five seconds now. That's lovely. I could probably just take it off, right? Try that. Oh, maybe it was, was it just loose? I don't know. I'll throw it in the bag. It'll beep in my bag. It's going to drive me crazy. All right, so if we try and change value here and then we want to print our foods, we're changing our copy. Right? Just like if we did the regular for loop. It doesn't change the value here, right? We can't go change it because it's not changing it. But if we changed foods at the index, then it changes what's stored in the list, and we can change it there. So if we go through and do this one more time, and then we'll take foods at the index, 
equals the foods at the index dot upper. Now we can uppercase it, we can print foods out, and it actually changes here if we wanted to. So again, it's just a shortcut if you need the values and the index is out. You can use enumerate. It's really fun with loops here. All right, and then dice statistics. I like doing dice statistics on steroids because this one is not very interesting here. Uh, eventually it says, hey, print out a pretty looking histogram, which is fine, but it's only two dice. And what's the fun of that here, right? So the last thing we're going to do is go nuts with our dice stats. I was going to do it for the lab, but I forgot it gets a little bit complex. So we'll do the demo here. So what we want to do is we want to ask the user how many sides do they have in their die? Because it turns out there's more than just six-sided dice. Ask, I'm very familiar with this. It's okay. Um, giant nerd. And they're on my forearm here. <laughs> um, so lots of different sides you can have on a dice. On a die. Um, apparently YouTube filters things. Uh, if, you, if you call it a die, you get like auto-censored on YouTube. So if you watch people, like they will always call it dice, even if it's a singular one. And that sounds really weird because they don't want YouTube to flag their content. Um, sure. So we'll get flagged, and I'm sure it'll be okay. And anyway, so we'll have sides on a die will be an int of an input of how many sides are on your dice here. Right. So four, six, eight, ten, twelve, twenty, thirty. Those are pretty common ones. I guess 30 is not as common, but the other ones are pretty common in your standard set of seven polyhedral dice. So we'll have sides on a dice. And then we'll have how many dice? How many dice is an int of an input? How many dice are you rolling? Uh, here we go. Rolling. There we go. Great. So, hey, I want four-sided dice, and I want to roll six of them here. Great. Let's go ahead and roll it. So what we want to do is we want to get the sum of that value. Right, so I'm going to do it this so that many times and sum those values up here. Um, so I could have the sum, we'll start off at zero and then for roll in, or, or no, how many rolls? Sorry, not how many dice. I guess that's how many dice here. So for roll in how many dice, we're going to take sum and we're going to add to it random.randint from one up to sides on a die. Right? Um, oh, in range, sorry. Range how many dice? There we go. You can't just go for an integer. So the range. So if I said it, I want to roll four dice, it'll be, I'll get zero, one, two, and three. I'm not doing anything with the value called roll. I'm just completely ignoring it. What I'm doing is using it to run this loop that many times here. And it'll add up my sum here. When I'm done, we can print you, your total, I don't know, your total is. And here's a formatted string, because that's easier, the sum. Right? So we can pretty quickly get, all right, so let's do six-sided dice, and let's roll four of them. 46 here. We got uh, total 17. Cool. And do it again. We should get a different number. Do it again, get a different number. Do it again, get a different number. Now, what if I wanted to build a pretty little histogram? Here. Should be able to do that, right? Now. To get the possible range of sums, so I can count how many times they show up when I roll them, you know, a hundred times, right? We need to generate probably a list with that many values in it. So what I want to do then is instead of just a single sum, I'm going to have list of sums here is a list, right? Now I need to have a bunch of zeros in here to start off because until I've rolled that sum, they showed up zero times. So what I want then is the max value. So for um, sum in, this will be sides on the die times how many dice. And this is the range up to that. And then I'm going to do plus one because I want to get indexes between whatever the lowest number is, whatever the highest number is. So the sides on the die times how many dice. If I just range, I won't get that number. So I'm going to add one so I get up to that highest number when I'm done. So I'm going to take my list of sums and I'm going to append a zero. So I started off with a zero now. So in every spot. So if I roll four six-sided dice, I'm going to have 25 zeros now in the list. Right? Index zero up to 24. Now when I get a sum here, so sum can equal... Um, Oh no, okay, so now I need to go and sum again. So that's right. So sum is starts off at zero. We'll go roll some dice. We'll add to it here. And then I want to do this a bunch of times here. 
let's do this like a hundred rolls. So for um, roll, I uh, shouldn't say roll. What do I want here for attempt? I don't know. Um, count in range hundred. We'll do hundred. Sure. We'll set the sum. It starts at zero, and we'll sum up those rolls here. And I'm gonna take my list of sums at the index of the sum. So whatever that sum was, I know there's an index that matches that because I had 25 indexes here. Now I landed on the sum, I'm going to take the zero and add one to it. Say, so, okay, I totaled up to 27. Or no, I have 46. I totaled up to 17. Find index 17 and go add one to it because now I've landed on 17. I'm going to do this 100 times and I'm going to get out my list of sums, right? So that I can say four. And now this is where the enumerate is kind of handy here because the index is actually the sum and the value that's stored there is how many times I rolled that. So I can say for the index, or really this is the roll and this is the count here in enumerate of my list of sums. I'm going to print formatted string. So here's the roll, colon, and here's the count. How many times I, I rolled that one here. So we're going to do that 100 times. So we have six-sided dice. We roll four of them at a time. Scroll back up to the top here. So I didn't roll up through zero at all. Oh, I should have. Uh, I should have gotten a, a four. Maybe not. Maybe I didn't roll enough times here. There's a rolling four six-sided dice. I should be able to get a four. That's okay. We'll look at our distribution later. So we never got any 24s either, so maybe we just didn't do it enough times here. We got 1, 5, 1, 2, 4, 8, 11. The most we got was 14. Seems pretty close here, right? Your average is 3.5 when you roll a 6-sided die. So 3.5 times 4 is 14, exactly. Seemed to work out okay. Let's try it again. Let's do 6-sided dice, roll 4 of them here. I didn't get any 6s this time either. Uh, no 24s. Again, ooh. My 14 was not the most common because it's, again, it's pseudo random. It should be mostly random looking. Uh, so I'm not going to get a perfect distribution with only 100 attempts, right, with 24 different values. So if I increase my values here, we'll get something a little bit better. Um, but again, we don't want to print the low ones we don't expect. So I can say, um, I can either change my list here that I'm looping through, or I can just check real quick. So if the roll is less than what do I have the numbers? Uh, how many dice? Then I want to skip it. Right? I don't want to do this here. Right? Uh, so if it's not, I guess it should be greater than or equal to then, right? So if it's greater than, greater than or equal to how many dice? Then I can print it. That'll essentially skip the ones that are too low, right? Because you can't roll a zero, you can't roll a one, you can't roll a two if you're rolling four dice. So I don't want to skip it here, and then. Up to 100 is not very much. If we wanted to actually print this out as a histogram here, right? I really want, what I want then is the percentage of times this one was rolled here. So to get the percentage of times it was rolled, I want the how many times it was rolled divided by how many times I rolled. It was 100. So that divided by 100. Uh, but times 100, okay, this is getting a little silly here. That's okay. Um, we should call this how many rolls here, or how many. How many rolls is 100? Because we can go change this later. There we go. Divided by 100. Divided by how many rolls times 100. And what I really want then is the star character times that. Times this. Right? I don't even need to sub that in here. Um, oops. I need... Maybe I do need that in curly braces. Got a literal... Okay, it's not... Shoot. It's unhappy with that. I guess we should calculate this first then. So this is my percentage. Is this? And then we can print that times the percentage. Is that going to work for us? Times the percentage. Oh. No, I can't. Hang on, so we'll print the roll. And then. We'll print, uh, change that ending character to a nothing, and then we'll print the star character times the percentage. 
That ought to print for me here, right? Percentage. Unexpected type. Oh, it can't be a float. This needs to be an integer here. Okay. Maybe that's why I didn't like it. Is that the whole issue? Um, in curly braces. Yay! Okay, that worked for me, I think. All right, so if I just had percentage as, a, as an integer, it would have worked. Okay. So we'll get the roll, a colon, and then we'll get the star times the percentage rate. How many times did I roll it? Divided by how many rolls I did times 100, because I want that as a whole number here. All right, so four dice. Oops, uh, sure. So 44 um, here. Up to 16, right, because I have four four-sided dice. I didn't get any fours here, but mostly my distribution is in the middle here. Oh, that roll is a little bit off, right? We kind of want that to, with some padding here then, right? So we want 0, 2, D for digits or something like that, right? To make, make it line up a little bit better. 4, D, 4 again. I should scroll up to the top. And now it lines up a little bit nicer here, right? Because so now we have a pretty little histogram. Oh, again, 11 wasn't quite even here. But now we can ask them as well, like, how many times do you want to roll? So instead of how many rolls being 100, it could be an int of an input. Any times do you want to roll those. All right, so how many sides are in your dice? So if we have six-sided dice, we roll them four times. Let's do like 240 here. Do a couple more rolls. We see our histogram, right? We didn't get any fours, interesting. We didn't get any 24s. All right, let's try even more. Right, let's run it again here. Um, six-sided dice, four of them. Let's roll like 10,000 times here. So we get a little better of a histogram. Looks perfectly even. Now I think we're just losing this because it's less than 1%, I think is the problem here. Because um, we don't have any stars if it's less than 1%. Like each star is essentially 1%. And if you're less than 1 because we're doing an integer conversion of that, we're just truncating that decimal. Um, so I think that's probably why we're not showing any here. I think it has a, a very small value, right? But now our dice histogram works for any number here, right? So how many sides on our dice? We can say like, hey, I want 13 sided dice and I'll roll them seven times each. Now right, let's do that a thousand, ten thousand times. We should still get a pretty nice looking distribution here of that. Yeah, again, each star being one percent, right? It's not the greatest looking curve here for all of our values, but um, maybe we could change our histogram. You just, if you do one star for each count, it gets a little bit funny. Um, as you start doing higher numbers. Um, I guess we could do that. So take out the, just do the star times the count. Instead of the percentage, should we just do that times the count? I'll leave this one here. We'll do it as a times the count. So now if we do it a thousand times, like what do we say, 17 sided dice, 13 times or something, we'll do it a thousand times. So we'll have a thousand stars total here. Most of them showed up in the middle, looks like, right? So this was not percentage, this was actual, like, this is how many times it showed up here. So this should be a thousand stars got printed off. You know, we see that there's a couple little stragglers here, right? But it'd be pretty rare to get those to the, the top bottoms here, right? Because you gotta get one out of 17 times 13 times. What is that percentage here? One, one out of 17, no, nope. delete, not nah, print screen, delete, one, stop. 1 divided by 17. Numlock, come on. 1 divided by 17. To the 13th, right? To the 13th. That's a really small number here. You're probably not going to get that number very often. So that's all. That went a little fast. I'm sorry. I really like dice. <laughs> um, but using some loops, right? So we're setting up. Here's where I'm going to start totaling all of those sums. And here's where I'm going to go through and actually count what it is. I'm using the index here, so I don't even need a dictionary. It's not like there's a key and an associated value. The index essentially is my key. I'm using index for double duty, right? Hey, it showed up here. We could do this with a dictionary if we wanted. Instead of using a list here, we could do it with a dictionary and say, hey, let me go add the key here. That's one option. That's kind of fun to do it that way. Um, should we do both? Should we practice the dictionaries? Or is this just too much and we should call it a day? I'm okay with either. You're that spaced out. 
Okay, I think we should call it a day then. We don't need to do it with dictionaries. It's fun though. Uh, maybe we'll come back to that. All right. Um, don't forget to get started on the project. Do not Monday, but a week from Monday. Um, so get started early, ask me questions about it. Happy to help. Um, I'll be in the CIS building for office hours next Wednesday before class. We can talk about it during Monday, during lab or after lab. Bring your questions there as well. I'm happy to chat. Don't wait until October 14th to ask me questions, please. Please, 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 please. It does not go well for anybody. I don't like getting up until like 10 a.m. anyway, because I like being up till really late hours. So if you send me questions while I'm driving, I probably won't answer them. That's all. Okay. All right, well, thanks, everybody. I will see you next week. Have fun with your iBooks.